Learning the basics of cabinet making can really enhance your woodworking skills. I'm going to build these set of cabinets in this video today using three quarter inch plywood with three quarter inch face frames that are pocket screwed together. I've got really easy doors and drawers I'm going to show you how to make. Stub tenon groove. Drawer boxes are made with uh, half blind dovetails. Simple hardware, simple tools. Let's get started. Okay, in this section we're going to build the base carcass. As you can see, three quarter inch plywood I use for all the parts. Uh, it's just a fairly efficient use of material. Um, and it's also very sturdy. I like to use three quarter inch material also because I use pocket screws for joinery. It gives me plenty of material to grab a hold of. So we'll kind of walk through the components here. I've got two sides. Um, each side has a set of shelf pin holes that we'll have to machine. Uh, it's got a bottom that fits into a dado. That's glued in place. Top stretchers, you got a back stretcher and a toe kick board down below. These are all attached with pocket screws. Now you'll notice that the uh, back stretcher here is a little bit wider. And I like to make mine around seven, eight inches wide. Two reasons. One, it gives the box a little more rigidity in this stage. And two, once you have your drawers in place, if you use a back mount drawer slide that we're going to be using, this gives you plenty of material and plenty of room to adjust to attach those two. So let's head to the bench and get started. So the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to lay out, do all my joinery layout while these panels are flat. Uh, one thing to consider if you're buying uh, plywood, um, typically you can buy a, a, an A1 grade, which is a good one side. The other side isn't necessarily bad, but it may be discolored. There might be some of those football patches in it. So just keep in mind if you want to, if these cabinets for, are for nice or for show, you've got an outside and an inside. So I've got my two sides. Um, I'm going to lay out my toe kick. I'm going to lay out my um, shelf pin holes. And, uh, and then I'm going to lay out my uh, dado for my bottom. And then I'm going to machine everything. But it's a lot easier to do that when it's flat. First thing is the toe kick. Now I'm just going to use my square here. And I'm going to lay out a line on the bottom, three and a half inches up from the bottom. Now toe kick, you don't have to put a toe kick on every single cabinet that you do. But if it's a cabinet that you're working at, you'll definitely want a toe kick because when you come up to it, your feet need some place to go. All right, three and a half inches up, and I put mine two and a half inches. I'm going to lay this line out two and a half inches in, and by the time I add the face frame to the top, I'm going to be plenty deep. And I'm simply just going to use a jigsaw to cut these out. I like to cut on the inside face because of, as the blade comes up, it's tearing the fibers. If it does tear the fibers, it's going to be on the inside and not the outside. Next step, I'm going to lay out for my shelf pin holes. Now, you don't typically in a base cabinet, um, usually have one shelf, not always, um, but I like to provide a little bit of an adjustment in the bottom just in case you want to move it around. You don't need a lot of holes, and what I typically use is a, uh, a jig that I've made, uh, just a shelf pin hole jig. I simply drill holes at the intervals that I want to space them at, and more often than not, these are jigs that you can reuse for other projects, which is this is exactly what this is. Um, I've taped off because I don't want to use all of these holes. First thing I want to do is I'm going to line this jig template up with the bottom of my cabinet, and I'm going to keep that on the same reference every single time, so I know that all my holes are going to be in the same, the same level. I'm also going to set, set this back a little bit from the front edge and to keep it consistent, I'm going to set my ruler at two inches and then position the template back. And then we're just going to simply clamp it in place. Now, I'm using a uh, VIX bit, just a brand name, but this is a self-centering bit. It's got a little collar on there that fits the hole that I've pre-drilled here. Okay, now that I've got my shelf pin holes drilled in the base cabinet size, and my toe kick cut out, the only thing left is, is I'm going to make sure or lay out for my dado in my bottom, where my bottom goes into. Um, and I'm going to position that four inches up from the bottom. Bring that line over, 
and down the face. So I'll know where to set up on my table saw for my dado. Okay, now I've got my dado set in place and I'm going to adjust the height to 3 eighths of an inch. And I'm going to make a test cut. Okay, we can see that my, uh, my dado is just a little loose, so I'm going to figure out which one of these shims needs to come off. And the way you do that is basically start taking shims off and fill in the gap, and when you find the culprit, then you know. I'm going to start by taking off the outside shim first, and we're just going to try that guy. Looks like we got a nice, nice tight fit in there. Okay, now that I know I've got the dado set set the way I want it, I'm going to move my fence over to four and an eighth of an inch because that's how far up from the bottom of the side that I'm going to cut this dado for the bottom panel. Okay, now that I've got my dado cut for my bottom, I'm going to leave my dado set up in the saw, but I've got one more thing to do on this. I'm going to cut a rabbit in the back. Uh, of each one of these side pieces for my back. Um, I'm going to use, obviously I don't need a three-quarter inch rabbit in the back necessarily for this application, but I am going to use a, a sacrificial fence so I don't have to change my dado set. Dado set. I am going to cut a half inch uh, wide rabbit. Um, it's a little deeper. I'm going to use quarter inch plywood for the back. It's a little deeper. But what that allows for is a little material for scribing to a wall. Now if you're in a situation where your wall is way out of uh, whack, you may want to leave a little extra material. So, but I'm, I'm usually fairly confident a half inch is going to be going to fit for most applications. So I'm going to set up my uh, sacrificial fence. And I have not changed the height of the blade. I'm going to leave that the same. I'm going to set this to cut a half inch deep. Okay. The stretchers I'm going to use are made out of the same three quarter inch plywood that the uh, sides and the bottom are. Um, and you know it's good sturdy material so there's no reason I can't use it. Now I'm going to use pocket screw joinery to attach these to the sides. Now, most pocket hole jigs are have the same similar features that they have but you've usually got a cam clamp that holds a piece securely in place while you're uh, drilling. Um, they also have several different holes for different, some of them have different holes for different thicknesses or different widths of material. Um, the key thing with the pocket hole jig is, is setting the depth of your collar though. Um, some of the jigs come with uh, these handy guides on them, um, but I've found that the easiest way to do it is just stick it down in the in the tool itself. And I like to leave mine oh about an eighth to three sixteenths away from the bottom edge. Uh, often the screw is going to pull itself in a little deeper. And what you don't want happening is when you're driving pocket screws into the into this, you don't want them coming through the side of your cabinet. So I'm just going to show drilling a few of these holes here from one of my stretchers. We'll do both ends. to now attach the back top stretcher to the top edge of my back stretcher. And this, this is where the drawer guides are going to get attached to. You use this one to attach your top. It also gives lots of reinforcement to the box. Now we're ready to assemble this box, and I'm 
I'll take you through a couple stages here. The first step, um, I like to use squaring braces uh, to kind of help me hold these pieces in position while I'm fitting everything. And these are pretty handy little deals. Uh, there's ones you can buy on the market, several different manufacturers, or these that I've just made out of three-quarter inch plywood. Um, they keep things pretty square. And it also is just kind of a third hand. So I'm going to slide my bottom into place here. Clamped in place. All right. I'm going to take my back stretcher and I'm just going to kind of set it here as kind of a, a leg to kind of give me some support while I stick my other side on. Okay, good fit. All right. I'm going to actually attach my top stretchers at this point. I'm going to screw them in place. This way I can, I can clamp the sandwich together. Whenever you're using pocket screws, the key to that is, is really holding the, your work pieces secure. Otherwise, it'll want to walk around on you. Make sure your top stretcher is flush at the top. And this back stretcher is flush with the front of that rabbit right there. You don't have to worry too much about the top at this point. All right, now I'm going to do the uh, front stretcher, same way as I did the back. Just going to attach it to the bottom panel right now. Clamp it in place. Okay, now that I've got the stretch, the top, top and back stretchers secured to the one side. I can now add glue to my dado and glue and screw the rest of this box together. Okay, I'm going to apply glue in the bottom of the dado. All right, apply some glue to the top of this bottom piece here. That way I don't have glue dripping out of my dado all over the place. Place it over. One thing to think of when you're clamping big carcasses like this, especially dados and rabbits, is that you've got squaring braces here that are trying to keep things square. One thing you want know, to make sure is keep trying to keep your clamp as parallel to the panel as possible. So any of that could make that rack out of a square. Okay, now we're going to secure the other side to the top and back stretcher. And again, make sure that's flush. It's flush on the top. Clamp it tight, and we'll screw it in place. Okay, I'm clamping the front top stretcher in place, making sure it's flush too. Drive a couple screws here. Okay, now I've driven my last screw on the top rails. I'm going to check for square real quick. And a good way to do that is just simply measure the diagonals. And if they're equal, then you're pretty square, which looks like we're pretty close. Um, you know, your box doesn't have a lot of lateral support at this point, not until you get your face frame on. So, you know, it can move a little bit, but it's, it's probably going to be pretty, pretty close, and, and you want it that way. So you don't have to really tweak it when you're putting your face frame on. Okay, now that the glue has had a chance to dry on this, 
I can remove some clamps. I'm going to attach the toe kick. Um, I like to put a toe kick backer in here. You have a decorative toe kick that goes over the face of this once you put you know, multiple cabinets together. But I like to do this piece because it adds one, a little more strength to the box, and two, it gives you a place to attach that decorative toe trick kick at the end. Same, same sort of attachment method. I'm just going to pocket screw it in place. I've added a little glue to the top edge. After I've got those screwed in place, I just throw a couple of clamps on here so that has time to glue has time to dry and set up and hold that bottom tightly to it. Okay, at this point, our uh, main box is done, and uh, we've got um, the template for the face frame, which is next. And uh, I'm going to put the face frame together, and we'll show you how to do that. In this section, we're going to talk about the face frame and how to build that. Um, as you can see, I've got, uh, got it in place here, kind of sitting on the cabinet here, so we get a better view of how this goes together. I like to build a face frame that's slightly larger than the box. And what this does is kind of gives that built-in a uh, little, little bit of uh, fudge room in case your dimensions don't kind of work out right on the money. You know, we're dealing with three-quarter inch plywood, which isn't really three-quarters of an inch. So if you allow yourself a little bit of an overhang on the sides, um, that way you don't have to quite line that up dead on every time. So I've, I leave about a quarter of an inch of a lip on each side. One, it gives you that fudge factor. Two, if you're joining cabinets together, it also gives you a little room to maneuver those cabinets when you're attaching the face frames. As you can see, pocket screws used at all joints, just butt cuts. So uh, let's head over to the bench and get started. I've got my material already milled to size. Now I'm using three quarter inch uh, maple. Um, I like to use hardwoods, that's a durable uh, face frame. You know, if it's something you're going to paint, you may consider poplar as, a, as an alternate choice. Uh, but maple works good, it's good and hard, good and durable. Um, you want to make sure that your uh, material is square, so when you're machining it, you want to make sure that all corners are at 90 degrees, because the pocket hole joinery system that I'm using, it's, it's a pretty critical step. Um, in the face frame, I'm going to use a two side styles that go on the uh, sides, and I've got three uh, rails going across horizontally, uh, top rail, bottom rail, and then one in the center, which will then divide out my drawers for my doors. Um, I'll then have a vertical rail going down the center, one in the top for the separate the two drawers, and then one that I'll have to cut to size to fit to separate the two doors. Um, like I said, pocket hole joinery. Um, you're basically drilling pocket holes in the rails only to start with. Okay, now that I've got my pockets all uh, drilled out, I've got one thing left to do on the uh, bottom rail. Um, this is a little something I do for inside the cabinet. I like to route a little round over on the inside edge because when the face frame sits on the cabinet, it's going to be slightly higher than the bottom. I'd like to just ease that edge with an eighth inch round over bit. One thing to consider when you're doing pocket hole joinery is, is it always determine which side's the best face. And remember that you're always working off the back side. So the ugly side's going on the back. I picked my best face on my style here. I'm going to put it facing down. I'm going to bring my uh, top rail over. And just using a vice grip type clamp here with some pretty big heads. One little thing I like to do uh, to keep hold, hold these pieces together a little bit better, you, one, you're using pretty tight grip, but also I like to put a little piece of uh, sandpaper on there. And it doesn't have to be 80 grit. You'd probably be better off like a 220 grit so it doesn't really mark up your wood. But that keeps those parts from kind of scooting, scooting apart. So you're lining up the top edge of both pieces, making sure they're tight together, and you're just going to clamp that down. Tighten that up just a touch. You want it pretty snug. We're going to do our bottom rail. Okay, now I've got my perimeter done. I've got my top and bottom rail, and I've got my two sides. Now I'm going to add that drawer divider rail or the center divider, center rail, um, and to position that. I've already pre-cut my 
drawer divider, the center style, if you will, that divides the two drawers. Uh, this I'm going to use to help me space the exact location. I'm not going to attach this quite yet, but in this way I know but that I'm going to be in just the right position. Do one side at a time. Now I'm going to drill the pocket screw holes for my drawer divider. Now this is just going right in the center. So I'm going to mark a couple layout lines on my center rail and my top rail here. My overall width is 34, so half of that, 17. So make a tick mark there on the top, or mid rail and the top rail. Now I always like to kind of check my measurements by going from the other side and making sure that it's actually centered, my math is right. And then again, I'm going to mark a center mark on this piece as well. Okay. So I've got my layout lines. Line them up. Clamp it in place. Okay, so one piece left to do. This is with a dividing the two doors down below. Now this is the kind of the wild card piece. Um, you know, as you as you go along, you know, you you build your machine, your material to exact tolerances. But I mean, even a little small 32nd or 64th can creep in, and it can start to add up. So what I like to do is wait for this final piece and just do a uh, kind of a mark to fit. And one of the ways I do this to get a really accurate marking is I like to use a little marking knife in a situation like that. Uh, you butt one in against where it needs to go and then make a small little incision in the piece of wood. And then I know exactly where I need to make my cut. I'm going to pick my best face and it's going to go down. Let's try our fit there. Perfect. And you don't want it too tight that you spring out the bottom rail. So another way of checking that it's checking it against the edge, and I've got a good snug fit there, so I know it's going to work. Now all I do is uh, drive my, uh, drill my pocket screws. Okay, same as before. We're just going to measure across. We know that the center is 17 inches. We determined that, so I'm just going to make a couple more center line marks. There's our completed face frame for the base unit. I've got uh, two drawer openings on top, and I've got two op door openings on the bottom. The main thing about gluing a face frame on um, you know, the top edge is the, you know, the only edge that's really flush, so that's where I like to start with my clamps, is I get that top edge flush and make sure I've got equal overhang on both sides, and then I work my way towards the bottom with clamping. So I've got my clamps over here, my glue, you want everything you're ready to do close by, because the glue doesn't set up terribly fast, but you want to be able to do this a fairly expedient way. And see, I'm not putting a really big bead of glue on here. You really don't need a whole lot of glue. And you don't want to have to clean up a whole lot of glue that's squeezed out at the end. So you're using just enough to glue that down. All right. Reposition or face frame. Starting at the top, kind of laying it down in place. Again, make sure it's centered. And flush the top. And now we can start the clamping process. One of the advantages of using the three quarter inch material for face frame or using a harder material is it's pretty rigid. So you don't need a whole lot of clamps. You don't have to clamp every single single inch. All right, as I'm going down the side, I want to make sure that my face frame has got the appropriate amount of overhang. You may have to kind of coax it around a little bit. It's okay. Okay. If you want, if you got them, go ahead and add a couple more in the center of the side rail. Having plenty of clamps in an operation like this is kind of, kind of good. Okay, 
Make sure nothing's shifted. It looks great. Um, let's let this dry. I've got the uh, upper cabinet. I just want to kind of point out a few features of what we're going to be building here. Uh, we've got your case construction. is much the same as the uh, lower cabinet. Uh, I'm not using any pocket screws, but I am dadoing the uh, top and bottom panel into the sides. And the top and bottom are the same, and the sides are the same. They're just mirror images of each other. So basically, same operations. You can uh, interchange them. Um, on the back, I've got a rabbit that's milled in the back for uh, my quarter inch back, but I've cut it a little deep, just like the base, so in case I need to do any scribing to, to an uneven wall, I've got material there to do that. Um, you might notice I've got a recess on the top and there's also one underneath on the bottom. And the reason I do that mainly for the bottom is so I can, if you're ever doing, in, say, uh, recess lighting or something of that nature, it can place to kind of hide or conceal those lights. Um, the face frame is simply glued on and I'm assembled the same way with pocket screw joinery. You know, you've got your two uh, styles, center style that divides out for two doors, uh, your top and bottom rail. And again, I kind of did this little trick here where I've actually rounded over the uh, back side of that so uh, things don't catch as you're coming out, We're trying to clean out your cabinet. And I've got two rails in the back on the upper and lower. so basically gives me a good solid surface to uh, screw um, screw into the wall. You know, anywhere along there you'll find a stud, you've got some solid material that you can uh, attach to. Construction of this uh, part is much like the base unit. Um, I'm going to do dado joinery. There aren't any pocket screws used in the case assembly itself, but uh, I will have some uh, shelf pin holes uh, for adjustable shelves and um, very, similar to the, very similar to the base. So I'm going to start by using the same jig um, that I had uh, before and I'm going to start by laying out um, and drilling some shelf pin holes. I'm going to go ahead and I had, remember I had tape over some of these earlier but I, I'm going to, I need more variability and actually you might honestly be able to do two shelves in this. So I'm going to put a few more holes in, uh, in this unit than I did the other unit and I'm just going to find the center make sure I'm centering these holes in the case. My cabinet's 36 inches tall, so 18 would be the center line. I've got seven holes, so I line that up on that center hole. Okay, I need a layout line in the back. 18 inches. Another thing I do too on a jig, just so you kind of keep track, is I always like to mark one position as being up. That way I know to put the jig in the same orientation on not only front to back, but also on the other side. So this gets those holes a little more in an accurate position. If you freehand drill these, even on your drill press, you may not have them all exactly the same distance apart, but it won't matter if they're all in the same orientation. All right, I'm just going to repeat the drilling for the other side. And at this point, one thing I am going to do, since both panels will be symmetrical, my arrow is pointing to this would be the up. I'm going to go ahead and mark on the end of the panel, just an X, that, that that indicates that this is the top of the panel. So I'll do the same for the other. Because once we go cut our dados and our rabbit, you will have mirror images. This will help you keep track of that so you don't have two lefts or two rights. So I've got my uh, three quarter inch dado set up in the saw, uh, much like I did for the base unit. Uh, it's shimmed out to fit the size of plywood that I'm using. And I've got my fence positioned. I'm going to position that an inch and an eighth in from the end. So I'm going to cut a dado on the top and the bottom. And then what that's going to do is create a little recess in the bottom of my cabinet. It's kind of nice on the bottom especially uh, if you ever want to put some undercounter lighting or something like that. It kind of disguises it. And the same reason on the top is just more of, I got in for in, I don't have to have a second setup. Okay, now that we have our dados cut, it's time to cut the rabbit on the back side. I'm going to put my sacrificial fence in place. Instead of having to change out the dado head to cut a half inch wide rabbit, I'll just bury part of it in the fence here.
We only want a half, of in, half an inch exposed. All right. Okay. Remember before we marked the top edge with an X. So when we cut this rabbit on the back side, I want one side, one panel with the X facing that way going to, through the saw, and then I want the other one, I'm going to flip around so the X is facing towards me. That way you have a right and a left. Okay, now I've got my parts over here on my assembly saw horses, and very similar to the uh, base unit, I'm going to stand up my top and bottom pieces in their dados. And again, I'm going to use these clamping squares to kind of help hold the pieces in the right position. I'm going to dry fit everything first. Okay, so everything goes together good. Now we're ready for some glue. Most critical thing about this is making sure that front edge is perfectly flush because you're attaching that face frame and you don't want it sticking out and making your face frame uneven. Again, we want to make sure our clamps are run parallel or parallel to the uh, bottom and top panels. Okay, before we set this aside to dry, I'm going to go ahead and get a quick little diagonal measurement, check the square. We look to be in pretty good shape there. Okay, got our case, uh, the glue's dried, and now we're ready to add one more part to this, actually, before we get our face frame on, and these upper, and which will be a lower uh, back stretcher. And the primary purpose of this, one, it gives a little rigidity to the case, but also it provides a place, once you've got these in position inside, a place for you to drive screws through into the studs in the wall or wherever you're anchoring to. So, first thing I want to do is I'm going to add a little bit of a bead of a glue on the back side of this, or the top side of this. Because we're going to glue it to the top drive a couple pins to keep holding that place. All right, we're lining this back face of the stretcher up with the rabbit and the top or bottom. I've got a pretty good tight fit here, but Again, driving those screws, if you don't clamp it, it's going to walk on you. Just going to clamp that up there so I can drive some pins. Okay, with that side done, we're just going to flip her over and do the other side. Okay, so our case is done. And we are ready for the face frame. 
The face frame joiner is just like that on the lower cabinet, only there aren't as many pieces. Drill pocket holes in the rails and screw them to the styles. Then as before, I use the face frame to find the final length of the center style that creates the two door openings. Then the center style is pocket screwed in the center of the frame. Okay, so we've got our upper case assembled and we've got our face frame completed. So it's time to glue those two together. I'm going to start by applying a thin bead of glue on the edge all the way around. We're centering it side to side. If you want, you can use a little ruler or try square or something like that, but it's pretty easy to eyeball that. So I've got my uh, ends flush down here. Looks like they're pretty flush up there too, which is a good sign. And I'm going to start by clamping this end first. It's flush. Keeps my overhang straight. Okay, with that in place, we can now move on to uh, attaching the doors for this unit. Okay, I've got my door parts ready to be uh, machined. They're already cut to size. I've got my door rails and my door styles and my door panel. Uh, I'm going to do a stub tin and groove, and the beauty of stub tin and groove is I'm going to size my groove to fit plywood. Uh, we know plywood's not going to be that nominal quarter inch like it always said it is. So I can make two passes with an eighth inch curved blade and have this panel fit nice and snug. So let's go cut some joinery. I've also brought along some scrap material which is the same thickness, width and everything as what I've had because I certainly don't want to be making test pieces in my original or my final stock. So I've got my eighth inch standard blade in the saw and um, I'm going to use a three eighths inch long tenon. So my blade needs to be raised up three eighths of an inch to cut that deep three eighths of an inch groove. All right, so we're going to be making two passes. So what I want to do is I know that my plywood's pretty close to a quarter inch. So my first cut is going to be a test cut, and I'm going to cut it about a quarter, a little more than a quarter of an inch away. So I'm going to move my fence to about a shade under, a shade under 5 sixteenths. I know this is probably going to be a little tight, but I can always move the fence out until I can adjust so it fits tight. So I'm going to make my first pass. I'm going to flip the board in for in and make the second pass. Okay, so it's still just a little too narrow. So to make this groove a little bit wider, I've got to move my fence ever so slightly towards the blade. Now remember, you don't want to move it a lot because you're going to be taking material off both sides. So one little movement times two, so you don't want to get too wide. All right, so we have moved my fence in. I'm going to make two passes. Now that we're set up, we're ready to mill the grooves and all of our pieces, the, the rails and the styles both get a groove. Okay, now that we've got our grooves cut on our rails and styles, it's time to cut some tenons. I'm going to change out my eighth inch blade 
into a dado set. And I'm going to put on a dado set slightly wider than 3 8 of an inch. We're cutting a 3 8 inch long tenon, but I like to have a little bit more and then I can bury it in a sacrificial fence. Okay, so I've got a half inch dado set in here. You can kind of use your a rail or a style that you've already cut kind of as a guide. Now, as I kind of like to use that, lay that down there, and I'm going to lower the blade or raise the blade according to what I need to do. So the top of that, the top tooth, your outer, outer raker, is the same height as the outside of your groove. So I got my blade set up, I got my sacrificial fence on, and I'm going to put a fence on, auxiliary one on my miter gauge here so I can back up the cut I'm going to make on my tenons. I'm just sticking that on there with some double face tape. That'll work great. Now, I got my test piece that I cut my groove on earlier. I'm going to use this to cut my first tenon and see how, how close we are. Okay, we can see we're still pretty snug. So, I need to raise my blade just a touch. Again, you're going to make two cuts, so when you raise it, keep in mind you're, you're doubling up. Okay, I'm still tight. I can raise it a little bit more. It's a lot better to sneak up on that than it is to overdo it. Okay, so I've got a good fit. It's not terribly tight. It's not rattly loose. Plenty of room for uh, glue in there. So now we're ready to cut our uh, tenons on our rails. So all of our joiners cut on our door. Head back over to the bench and we can put this thing together. So I've got all my parts machined. I got my uh, door panel machine. Um, basically, I'm going to make sure you sand your door panel uh, before you put it in your groove because it makes it a lot easier to get into the corners. Um, I'm ready to go. So I'm going to dry fit uh, everything first before I even put glue on stuff. That way I know that everything's going to go together and I don't have any panic attacks when the, when the glue suddenly appears on the wood and something doesn't fit right. So it's a good idea to Make dry runs on everything. And you can see I've got a little bit of a tight tenon here. And I'm never really quite sure how that happens when you cut three, four tenons in a row and one of them ends up a little, little tight. But I've got a little trick I want to show. Um, two things you can do. One, you can use a little rabbiting plane, which I like to do to shave off a little material, or a sanding block with a square 90 degree corner on it with some 80 grit sandpaper, you can sand that thing down too. You can micro adjust your tenon. So I'm gonna, I am gonna take this to smidge of material off, off of that. And you keep track of the, the corners that it's going into too, because you're gonna put it right back in the same spot. Okay, that's a much, much better fit. You don't want to jam a tenon down into a stub tenon or into a groove because you will split that groove apart and you could crack the sides of your face frame. I think this one probably is a little tight too. So I'm going to go ahead and shave just a smidge off of that one as well. You see I'm not removing a whole lot of material. 
There we go, a much better fit. Things should go together without a big hammer. All right, I'm going to dry fit this one more time, make sure everything is okay. Okay, so everything looks to be good. All right, I'm going to first put a little glue down in the groove. Now what I like to do, uh, if this is the face of the door, I'd like to put glue in the groove but on the back side. That way if anything happens to squeeze out, it's going to be on the back side. But you really want to try to get the glue down in that groove. Now. Raised panel doors, you know, or anything that's solid wood, you don't want to glue your panel. You want it to float. In this situation, I'm actually using this panel as more of a structural member too. Because I don't have big long tenons, and these aren't going to be really strong. So, but with the combination of these tenons, the grooves, and your door panel, it's a pretty strong door. Okay. I'm just applying just a little bit of glue on each cheek of the, of the stub tenon there. Once I get one on, I'm going to go ahead and slide my panel in. A little bit of glue on this cheek here. Slide that in. Okay, and I'm going to apply glue on the remaining tenons. Okay. I'm going to clamp this up. You want to make sure your ends are flush. And I like to kind of keep the clamps oh, about a quarter to a half inch away from the edge. Also, it's a good idea to have them centered on your, on your rails. Again, make sure they're running parallel. If you've got to do a little adjustment. Make sure they're flush before you clamp it. And I'm just going to tighten that up. Okay, at this point you could do a diagonal measurement uh, to check for square. On, um, on a smaller door like this though, I mean, you've got two inches, two inch wide rails here. They're really going to kind of pull this door in a square. You can check it, but there's not a whole lot you're going to do to change it at this point. Larger doors are probably more of a factor. Small doors like this, it's going to kind of self-align itself. So really, this is how it's done. We've just got uh, a few more doors to make, and uh, we'll let this one dry. Okay, now that we've got our uh, doors made, uh, it's time to install some cup hinges. And um, I've got my door flipped over on its backside here. And I am going to put cup hinges about four inches down from the top and four inches up from the bottom. I'm just going to make a mark on my door, square out and extend that line. You can see it real well. And then I'm going to go over to the drill press and I've installed an inch and three-eighths Forstner bit. Um, it's the closest thing to the metric equivalent of these cup hinges. And I've set my fence, so I'm drilling um, this hole about an eighth of an inch away from the edge. And I've got my registration lines on my door. I'm going to line up the point of my uh, bit with that line. I've set my depth to the appropriate depth. I'm going to use my depth stop, and I'm ready to drill. I'm going to 
we'll slide it down. Line that up again with your line. Okay, now we're ready to install the cup hinges. Pretty easy procedure. You just drop the hinge down in the hole. Um, I like to use a self-centering uh, drill bit. This helps uh, with the placement of the hinge. One of the most important things with installing a cup hinge is making sure that this leading edge of the hinge runs parallel to your door, st door style there. So holding the hinge in place, we're just going to drill, pre-drill our, for our screws. Okay, so now we're ready to install these on the cabinet. So I'm gonna mount these doors onto my base cabinet. Now, remember, I measured down four inches and centered that hole four inches down from the top and four inches down up from the bottom. Now, I'm using a three-quarter inch overlay hinge. Okay, so that means I'm subtracting a three-quarters of an inch that's overlaying the face frame. That's how far down from the inside of this member I'm going to put my hinge. So I can lay that out. Four inches minus three quarters, three and a quarter inch. So I'm going to make a mark. Three and a quarter inches down. And then I'm going to make a mark. Three and a quarter inches up. I'm going to go ahead and pre-drill these too. I'm just using a small brad point bit. Draw a pilot hole, and you're centering that on the face frame material. Okay. These hinges install with just one pan head screw. So I'm going to flip both of my hinges over, position it over the hole. There are adjustable slots. So you just want to kind of center it now for start. Grab your screws. Okay. One down, three to go. That works great. Now that we have our doors installed, it's a good time since I've got it up on the saw horses. Before we start on our drawers, I'm going to go ahead and install the back. And I'm just using quarter inch plywood, and I'm just going to use some narrow crown staples and staple it right on the back. I've got the rabbit, the bottom, and the back I can staple to. Key thing is just to make sure it's flush on the top edge. Okay. Got that done. It's time for us to move on and get some drawers installed in this. I've got my drawer material milled to size here. I've got a front and a back. I've got two sides. You'll need to size your material to, sit, to fit the 7 8 inch spacing on a dovetail jig. So I've got mine at three and a half inches. First thing I'm going to do is I've laid out my parts on the, on the, t on the bench here. <clears throat> and I'm going to mark each corner with the same number. And the reason I want to do this is each piece is going to stay together all through the process of cutting and, and to assembly. So when I'm machining these, they, they need to go in, into the dovetail machine a certain way. And this way I can keep track of them. I'm also going to mark an X on top of each part as well. This is also for me to keep track of how they go into the jig. So now that we've got our parts marked, let's head on over to the jig and we'll get started cutting. Okay, so I've got a kind of a mock-up in here and I use uh, scrap pieces and obviously one thing about jigs is you're going to need plenty of scrap material. So when you're milling your material for your drawers, Always mill a little extra because you're no doubt going to need to set something up. 
Unless you've got a dedicated router, there's always going to be adjustments to be made. Just to kind of brief go through this dovetail jig, I've got down here is where I cut. These are my tails. In this case, with the three and a half inch width piece, I've got enough to be able to cut four tails. That piece gets locked in down below, and it actually rests on the underside of that template. And this template, which is where your guide bushing rides, goes in and out, cutting your pins and your sockets at the same time. And this, this is going to be your socket board, which is also going to be your front and back of your drawer. It gets locked in right on top here, and it butts up right against the back side of, the, of, the, of your tails. And a couple other features on this dovetail jig, you've got an adjustment down below here and one on top, and this adjusts your pieces back and forth so you can get your dovetails just lined up just perfect. Um, all jigs come with instruction guides, and they're pretty, usually pretty clear, so I make sure you read that and understand how to set your jig up. Okay, so when you're getting ready to route, you want to make sure your bottom of your router is firmly on top of that template. You don't want to lift it up. I always also like to try to try to keep my router in the same orientation as it's going through. Don't tw twist it around like that because that guide bushing may not be perfectly round and it's just good practice to go in and out. Follow those teeth go all the way around making smooth clean cuts. Now we're ready to start cutting some parts. I'm going to start with uh, number four. I've got my X's on the top sides. Remember those go to the outside. I'm going to lock my tailboard in first, which is my drawer side, and then I'm going to slide in my drawer front or back into the top and lock it in place. I'm going to check to make sure they're firmly locked in place, and we're ready to route. Okay, I've got my pins cut, looks like they look in good shape, and my sockets cut. These go together just like that. So now i got my first corner cut, alright, so move on to the second one. I'm just going to stay with the same piece, the front or back, and I'm going to slide it in. I'm going to put it in the top here, I'm going to look for the number one. I've got it here, X to the outside, and this is the tail board, it goes in first. Again, tied against the template. Make sure you get the dust cleared out in there. And this one's tied against my stops over here and tied against the back of the drawer side. Okay, so we're ready to cut this one. Okay, I'm going to just keep this piece in my hand. I got number two. I got my X on the, the top. I'm going to flip it over so X is going out. Again, tied against the, tied against the top or bottom side of that template. Okay, that piece is done. I've got my socket set on both sides. Find my number two. X goes to the outside. Position it, lock it down good.
Okay, so we've got our uh, drawer parts cut, dovetails are cut. I got one last, uh, one last thing to do on these drawers, and that's to cut a groove for the drawer bottom. So we're going to do that over on the table saw, and I'll show you how to do that. I'm just going to set up here where I've got my eighth inch blade in, and I'm going to make two passes with that just to match up for my quarter inch plywood. I've got my blade raised up, quarter inch, quarter inch groove, and I've also positioned my fence away from the uh, blade so I'm cutting just a little off center in that last socket, as you can kind of see there. I'm going to make one pass of all four pieces, and I'm going to come back, adjust my fence over so I, it fits the, fits the plywood bottom. Okay, now that I've got my first cut made, I'm going to slightly adjust my fence over. Now I'm going to use my scrap piece here and adjust that cut so my plywood bottom fits before I cut the rest of my pieces. So I'm just going to move it over just a, not quite an eighth of an inch. I'll make my first pass and if I have to move it again, I'll, I can move it again. Okay, so obviously I need to move it over a little bit more, still a little, little narrow. Okay, I've got a really good fit there. Now I'm ready to cut the rest of my drawer parts. Got my drawer parts all machined, got them all laid out here. Next step is to dry fit. Make sure everything goes together as you plan it to do uh, without the glue first. So, just going to start by assembling front and back onto one side. And I'm using a soft rubber mallet uh, to put these parts together. You don't want to mar anything. I'm going to put my bottom in place there. Again, I'm matching up my numbers corresponding corresponding joints. Okay, final side. Okay, great. Nice tight joints, it's exactly what you want. Okay, I think we're ready for some glue. So we'll just kind of tap this apart. I also like to sand my drawer bottoms at this time. I've done that, so, because you're not really gonna have an opportunity to do it after that. I also like to sand the insides of my drawers so I can kind of remove some of these numbers. Okay, so you notice when I was sanding these parts, I kept them in the same orientation that they, they were numbered in because now I've obviously removed the numbers. I still need to get them back in the same way they, they came apart. So. Just keep that in mind when you're sanding your drawers as you go. All right, so we're ready to add some glue. And I'm just using regular old yellow carpenter's glue. And I'm just going to apply a little bit of a little drop in each one of those sockets. You don't have to use a whole lot of glue. I'm also going to do a little acid brush here. And I just kind of spin it around in there and make sure it's good and coated inside that socket. I'm only going to apply glue to the socket pieces and not the pins. Go ahead and do both front and back. Okay, and since I am using plywood drawer bottom, not solid wood, I like to put a little glue in the grooves of the drawer. It keeps that bottom from not rattling around. Adds a little more strength to your drawer. You see I'm kind of putting the glue on the bottom side of that groove too. So if I get any squeeze out, it's going to happen on the bottom side hopefully and not inside my drawer. <sighs> OK, 
Okay, same way we dry fit it, we're going to assemble it right back the same way again. side. Looking good. Okay, at this point, the drawer is pretty much done. You know, if your joints go together nice and tight, there's really no need to clamp because those dovetails, if they're seated in there, your drawer is pretty much going to be where it is. You can check for square at this point too. To be honest with you, if you haven't machined your parts properly, it's probably not going to make much of a difference. I just let these sit on a flat surface, let them dry, and then we'll move on to sanding and finishing these as well. I've got my drawer glues all dry on the joints, and you know, one thing about dovetails and a lot of joinery, to be honest with you, even though I've got a precision jig a setup over here that I had dialed in right on the money, you know, sometimes you still end up with some hairline cracks in the joints. Also, sometimes you get a little tear out, even though you're using a backer board, you get these little cracks in your joinery. I've got a little trick that works pretty slick for this to cover that right up. And I simply just take a little bit of carpenter's glue, and I just kind of apply it right over the top and rub my finger and kind of rub it down in those little cracks. Don't need a lot, just a little bit. I'm going to cover up all those cracks like that, okay? And then I'm going to come back with my sander. And sand right over that. Sand that sawdust, that glue mixes in there, fills those cracks up really nice. You get a nice looking joint. So we've got our drawers, uh, drawer boxes all sanded up, eased edges on everything, they're ready to, ready to be installed. And I'm going to use epoxy coated um, glides. These are just standard glides you can buy at Home Center, uh, order online. Uh, they're readily available, they're inexpensive and they're very, very durable. Um, they come in two, two parts, one gets attached to the drawer, one gets attached to the case. First thing first is I'm going to attach the drawer slides to the drawer and then we're going to go over to the case. These are in rights and left, so you've got to keep track of that. Wheels go at the back and you're going to line up the front flush and these have connections on the top or on the bottom rather and then on the sides. I like to do both, a uh, couple screws on each side. Line it up with the front edge And I'm just going to put a couple screws in the side. Okay, so I've got the drawer slides on this drawer box. I've already done the other one. So let's head on over to the case and we'll put these in place. I've got these brackets that go on the back of the drawer slide. They mount back here on this back rail in the carcass and simply just slide them back over the drawer slides. The front of the drawer slide gets screwed to the face frame, flush at the front and resting on the lower rail. Use a level to help position the back bracket. Once both slides are in, push the drawer in place and check that the front is flush with the face frame. This one's not, so I need to adjust the bracket at the back. The screw holes are slotted so you can make these type of adjustments. Once the slide is properly adjusted, tighten up the screws. We've got our drawer boxes installed, and now we're going to add our drawer fronts. Uh, we remember these were assembled the same way as our, our doors. They got uh, rails and styles with a panel in the center. And how I'm going to attach this to the front is I'm simply going to use a little piece of double face tape as a temporary attachment. Got a little spacer that I'm going to lay right on top of my door. 
It's half inch. This gives me the three quarter inch overlay I need for my drawer face, just like on my door. And then I'm going to line it up on the edge with my ruler. And you're simply going to come reach inside here and just kind of press those two together. Nice, snug fit there. All right, we take our spacer out. I'm going to remove my drawer carefully holding on to that so we don't break that part. We're going to head over here to the bench. Now we're going to drill, pre-drill for screws in both corners so I can attach those two together permanently. There we go. Okay, we're just gonna repeat the same process for the other side and then we'll have the doors and drawers done on our base cabinet. Okay, now we have this unit almost complete. There's one more thing I want to add to this, and it's an inside. I've got a lot of space in here, and one way to maximize that is adding a shelf. And I'm going to build a shelf that fits right inside there. Okay, I'm at my bench, and I've got my uh, plywood cut for my uh, shelf. And um, just one thing about material for the, for the shelf. I, li I like to use plywood. I mean, we were using plywood for the project as it is, but you know, one thing about plywood, it adds a lot of strength. You know, it doesn't flex a lot. Particle board or MDF, you know, they're, they're good materials, but I just don't think they're really good for a shelf. So on top of that, I'm going to go ahead and make the shelf a little stronger even yet. Uh, when this thing gets loaded down, it may bend over time, but I'm going to add a piece of hardwood edging to this. It's inch and a half thick. I'm going to glue it right on the front of this thing. And it actually gives a little a mass, a little weight look to it, which is kind of nice too. So. As I said, I've got my shelf cut, and the only thing left to do here is I'm going to line up one end of my uh, shelf edge. And again, I'm going to use my marking knife because I can get a really good mark here. I'm going to mark the end of that, and then I'm going to head over to the saw and make a cut. Okay, feels pretty good. So then all that's left is we're ready to glue this in place. I'm just going to grab some clamps. Position that edging on there. With any gluing uh, two pieces together, and if you don't have some sort of a, a joiner, you know, like for example a butt joint, things like to slide around a lot. So what I kind of like to do is do kind of a soft clamp. I'll clamp it down real hard with my first clamp. So I just kind of get it going in the right direction. I'll come back with my second clamp. And I can kind of clamp that down pretty hard. So then I know I've got that position from end to end. It's not going to come out of flush. At this point, I'm going to kind of work my way down the panel, making sure that that top surfaces are as level as I can get them. Just eliminates a little sanding you have to do later. I'll let that set up for a little bit, and then we'll be able to sand that flush. I'm going to route a little profile on the front edge of that to ease that edge with a little round over, and uh, we'll be ready to install this. I've got one last thing to do to my uh, base cabinet before I can finish this project is I need a top. Choosing a top is basically to decide on where you're, where you're going to use this cabinet. For me, I'm just going to use this a little as a shop cabinet, so I'm just going to stick with three quarter inch plywood. Other good choices could be, you know, a laminate or, you know, if you want to get fancy, if this is going in your kitchen, obviously there's a myriad of choices. But let's show you how I'm going to make a top. All right, I've got three quarter inch plywood. I'm going to use as my, my substrate. And I am going to build up the bottom side of this using some of these furring strips. Now, the reason I'm doing this is one, I want an inch and a half thick countertop, which will also get me to the 36 inch working height that's 
kind of a standard industry standard, and it's it's a good working height. So like my workbench is, it's a good height for the for the cabinet too. Furring strips, you just use a narrow stock. I'm using like three inch material. Again, it's three quarter inch plywood, and I'm just going to put this on here with glue, and I'm just going to pin it on with a nail gun. One thing uh, to you know keep in mind, you don't have to get these cuts exactly right on the money. I actually kind of prefer to let it overhang just a smidge, even maybe a 32nd or 64th. Because what I'm going to do is attach this, come back with a flush trim bit, and clean up that edge so I know I've got a perfectly straight, flat surface to attach my hardwood edging with. So let's go ahead and glue and nail these guys on. Okay, now that I've got my edges all flush trimmed and everything's nice and square, I can flip my top over to right side up, and now I'm ready to put my hardwood edging on. I've got two side pieces and one in the front. You won't need edging on the back side because that's going to go against the wall. So I'm going to start by mitering the front or the two end pieces here. I'm going to miter those and I'm going to miter one corner of my front. So I'm going to head over to the saw and make those cuts. Now I already set up my saw to uh, cut at a 45. I've checked this. And I'm going to go ahead and make the cuts on my sides. I'm going to cut one end of my front. Okay. Now that I've got my pieces, some of them mitered already, I'm going to start with uh, one corner that I've cut on my front and one of the sides. And it looks like I've got a really nice, nice fit there. So I'm going to go ahead at this point, I'm going to go ahead and mark and cut off the back tail of this side. I don't have to cut it right now, but I certainly can mark it. All right, I'm going to go to my other side here, and I'm going to grab a couple clamps to kind of hold this piece in place while I mark for this last miter. Check that again. Okay, we're still good. Clamp that in place. It's not going to move on us. It looks like one clamp will probably be enough. Okay. So I'm going to slide that piece tight up against the front. And again, I'm just going to mark that outer edge. Okay, this line I'm going to have to trans transfer across to the bottom because I'm going to be making my miter like this. So I'll need that mark on the bottom edge of this. Okay, head back over to the saw and make our cut. And I'm actually going to cut it purposely just a shade long because I'd rather have come back and cut it to fit, have to trim it, than be too short first time. So I'm going to make my cut. Okay, I'm still a little long. Just a shade more to shave off there. Okay, that looks good. Okay, now I can take, mark my other side piece here, and then we can cut off the tails. Okay, now we've got all our parts cut to size. I'm getting ready to glue and clamp this in place. One thing that I've done here is I've made things a little easier for me. Uh, since my edging happened to be a little bit thicker, 
than the two pieces of plywood, which I'm not really concerned about. I could cut it down, but it's easy enough for me to line it up with the top edge. I just stuck my top on top of some spacers. So I'm going to start by gluing my front in place. Go ahead and get your clamps over here and get it ready. And just do a little soft clamp just to kind of get it firmed up. I'm going to check my corner with my side. Looks like the miter comes together really nice there. Go ahead and clamp that down. And then we're going to kind of work our way across the front. Just kind of moving that piece back and forth until we get a nice flush edge there. Another thing I'm doing too is I'm keeping my clamps laid down flat because I'm going to come back across and clamp my two ends on so there's plenty of room for me to, gr to grab there. So I've got this nice and tight. I can go ahead and glue on one of my ends. I'm going to check my fits one more time here. It's perfect. I'm just going to glue on one end at a time because it's really kind of hard to manipulate both ends. And I'm going to put a little glue in that miter too. Wrap the clamp. Okay, so we'll give that a chance to set up, and when that's done, we'll put on our final end piece. Okay, we've got all our clamps in place. Let's let this uh, set up, and then when we come back, we'll uh, sand this top flush and uh, put a little edge treatment on those uh, corners. Okay, so I'm getting ready to install my uh, drawer pulls and door pulls, and on my drawer face, I've got a little inset here, and uh, I made a jig, it was just a template basically. It's Got two holes centered four inches apart, same as my pole, and it's centered on this piece, which is centered in the opening of my drawer. So I just place that template in there using my drill bit, and I also like to use a, a backer in here so it doesn't blow out the back of the drawer. So I'm just going to drill my holes. Now because I'm using a false front with a drawer box here, the screws that usually come with the hardware, you're going to have to get a little bit longer ones. So just head down to the hardware store, take your pull with you to make sure you're getting the right threads because they're all over the place. They could be metric or standard, but best to have it with you. I found some long screws at my local hardware store that work just great. So now I've got my drawer poles on place. Next up are the doors. So now I'm going to do the same sort of thing that I did with the drawers as I'm going to do with the doors. I've got a, another template. And this just helps keep my mounting of my hardware consistent from door to door and drawer to drawer. So I made another template specifically for the door. And I'm just going to clamp it in place. And I grab my backer board. I added rubber bumpers up here on top to the drawers. And I'm going to do the same on the doors here. I'm going to do one at the top. And 
and another one down at the bottom. One more thing that these bumpers do as well is it kind of brings your doors and drawer faces into alignment. Because of these European style hinges, they kind of stick out a little bit. So that bumper kind of helps equal that out. So you've got a nice straight flat front. I've got my base unit positioned here on the wall where I want it. Now the first thing I need to do is I'm going to need to level this base cabinet up before I attach it. I'm going to do that just using some common builder shims and a little level. Um, I've set the cabinet and I kind of see and I'm tilting forward just a little bit, but I'm also seeing that I'm not going to have to do any scribing because one, I've checked this earlier and I'm, I'm pretty level front to back. I've got a nice tight fit against the wall, so what I know I need to do is now shim underneath the front and that's exactly what I'm going to do first. Simply slide, push the cabinet back against the wall, it's tight, slide your shims into place, right underneath the front edge there, Check to make sure you're still level. I'm also going to have to shim on the other side too. But you're also going to want to keep checking your level. Make sure you're level side to side as well. And I'm looking pretty good there. Front to back's good here. I think we're in great shape. Now I can kind of rock the cabinet. It doesn't move at all. I've got nice tight fit against uh, both sides. So now I'm simply going to screw through this back rail into the wall. This situation I've got wood paneling so I've got anywhere I want to go but you'll want to look for studs because that's where you want to attach the cabinets to. Now because I did not, I didn't use my scribe in the back side, I've got a gap here so I don't, I don't necessarily want to pull that back rail against the wall because it could pull my drawer slides out of alignment. So what I'm going to do as I'm also going to kind of drop some shims down back in here too, fill in that gap before I drive screws to attach it. Slide those in. You want them too tight, just, just perfectly snug. And we're going to pre-drill for our screws. And one final step. Now that I've got this secured, I'm going to go ahead and cut my utility knife. Top of the shim, snap them off. Now I'm ready to install my top. Simply place it in position, tight against the back wall. Again, if you don't get a perfect fit there, you can scribe that to fit the wall. Not all walls are going to be flat. So I'm going to secure this in place from underside through those top two rails. Place my drawers back in place and we're ready to set the top cabinet. With the help of a friend, I've got this cabinet in place now. Again, I'm going to make sure it's level and I'm looking pretty good shape there. I've got these temporary jacks in here to kind of help hold it in place. You do need to apply pressure back against the wall, but it's securely there. Again, I want to screw through my back rails, top and bottom, into a stud, but since I've got nice wood paneling, I'm just going to go ahead and put them where I want them. I'm going to do the same thing for the top. I can take my jacks out, reinstall my doors, and then I'm ready to use this cabinet. Now that I've got my cabinets installed, I've got one last detail to touch up here, and that is putting on my decorative toe kick face. So I'm going to cut off these shims. I'm just going to tack it in place. There's nothing complicated about building a solid set of good looking cabinets. Now that you've seen me run through the process, I hope you'll give it a try. Good luck and stay safe in the shop.